Um, we've said this sort of many times this morning already, but the theme of this morning is reconciliation in honor of us keeping in mind all the thousands of um, First Nations people and how we recognize how significant this week has been in part of um, our journey together. Now, I've got a few disclaimers before we start. Firstly, I'm a preach thief. So if you have heard some of these ideas in podcasts or archives um, around, your memory does not deceive you. This is simply because I am just repackaging these ideas in a different way. So you might have heard some of these ideas somewhere else. Um, I take no kind of credit for them. Um, the second thing, I think it just, especially given the kind of political and uh, trauma lens that we see Reconciliation Week through, I think it's just important to kind of humbly acknowledge that I am a white, privileged, migrant female afforded all the opportunities of health, wealth and education that the first world can offer, really. And so I'm under no pretense that I contribute anything to the experience of the thousands of First Nations people who we hold in mind today. Um, I've certainly done some research um, on the notion of reconciliation within the discourse of First Nations rights, and as a Christ follower, it has probably left me with more questions than answers. And so I just want to sort of temper your expectations that you will leave today with a mandate on how the people of God should respond to the challenges of reconciliation and, and the plight of First Nations people. Um, but my sincere hope is that you will be touched by Jesus and you'd see his great story of reconciliation and that you'd be provoked to think about the idea of reconciliation and how you work that out and how we work that out collectively as, um, as the people of God. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I am not a light, fun, witty person, and that serves you well, <laughs> because this is not a light, fun, witty kind of topic, right? Um, for those of you who know my husband, Craig really carries the lion's share of humor in our family, but, um, well, sort of, it's a bit touch and go, right, isn't it? <laughs> Um, but I think the idea of reconciliation and this idea of repair is something that I really love and I've been so touched by it personally in the Gospels and I love working it out professionally and so my hope is, is that we can use that and dive into it together. So firstly, just by way of kind of foundations and definitions, I think it's important that we acknowledge the dialectical tension and the definition of reconciliation. So we think about what is a dialectical tension? Well, it's two different ideas that are simultaneously true, right? It's not either or, it's and. Right, so there's a dialectical tension in how we define reconciliation. And that differs in the definition of reconciliation is different when we work it out in our horizontal relationships with each other and then our vertical relationships between us as humans and God. Right, so when we think about horizontally, as humans, reconciliation speaks to this idea of the repair of a rupture, right? It's the coming together of parties, the wrongdoer and the wronged, the forgiveness of one towards the other, and some mutual acceptance towards working together. Mark van Romberg taught this in our city group, right? Let's be very clear. In our vertical relationships between us and God, we do not make peace with God. He makes peace with us, right? In our vertical relationships between us and God, we do not reconcile with God. He reconciles us to himself. He is God and we are not. There is no coming together. There's no working towards mutual acceptance. There's no 50-50 or even an 80-20 split. It's 100-0, like Jesus plus nothing, right? And I think it's important that we recognize that difference. Okay, so reconciliation in the scriptures is really the heart of forgiveness. And um, if you've read the Bible or if you know something of the Bible, there are many stories that um, speak to this idea of reconciliation. But today we are going to look at the life of Joseph, uh, particularly the last part of his life, which um, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it's the first book and it's the last uh, couple of uh, chapters in Genesis. So typically, the story of Joseph covers Genesis 42 to 50, which is eight chapters, so we'll be here a while, but um, no, I'm only kidding. So we're going to be skipping through much of this, and we're going to land on the last verses of chapter 50, which is something of a family reunion. So 
If you're unfamiliar with the life of Joseph, particularly his early life, he is the favorite son of his father, Jacob, in what, if you read in the subtext, was a large dysfunctional family in the early part of the Old Testament. Jacob had two wives, two concubines, 12 sons, and one daughter. As a 17-year-old, Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery into Egypt. His brothers faked his death in Canaan and lied to their father that he had been killed by a wild animal. And we need to recognize this because it gives us something of the context as to why Joseph would need to be reconciled. Like, why is this even a big deal? Can you imagine the context of something of how he'd been wronged? Can you imagine, look back to when you were 17, you'd been beaten up and ganged up on by your siblings, you'd been left for dead, sold into slavery in a foreign country, you don't speak the language, you come from a disenfranchised minority group, and you're vulnerable to all sorts of abuse in a context where human rights are not yet a thing, right? Like, this is a big deal. They rarely pull the dirty on their brother. And in our story, we meet Joseph at approximately the age of 37. Now, his life up to this point had been filled with a few ups and downs, right? He's gone to jail. He's had advances from an older woman. And quite remarkably, at the age of 30, he finds himself second in charge in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. He's essentially the governor. Like, think ScoMo and Josh all in one. And he's given responsibility for nationwide infrastructure and food provision across the next 14 years. The first seven years are an abundant seven years where there is much harvest, and the, the, this is prophesied or revealed to Joseph in a series of dreams, and then the second seven years is a time of famine where not only Egypt but all the regions ab- around will rely on Joseph's gift of administration. We are covering eight chapters, and so I'm going to dip in and out of Scripture to give you an idea of what's happening for Jacob and Joseph and their wider family. So if you've got your Bibles, join with me. We're going to start in Genesis 42. I promise you we won't do the whole eight chapters. Um, If you don't, I'm fairly certain that the the Scripture will come up um, behind me. So we're going to start in Genesis 42, verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why are you standing around looking at one another? Go. I do that in the mornings before school. Like, why are you standing in the entrance hall without shoes on? Go. You know, doesn't it sound like a parent? And so Jacob is telling his sons, go. Genesis 42 verse 4. Listen to Jacob's hurt, right? Hear how traumatized he is. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, for he feared that harm might come to him. Remember, Benjamin was younger than Joseph. So clearly, Jacob's ghosts from losing Joseph linger large in his life. We skip over to Genesis 42, 7 to 8. As the brothers come into Egypt, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to him. So we understand something of Joseph's understandable anger towards his brothers, right? You can feel the, per- the, the hurt and the pain. You can see the rupture and the lack of warmth and the lack of trust. So I, I bring those verses to your attention to understand the kind of heart of rupture, that you'd understand why this is such a big deal. Let's jump into a bit of an ad break and skip ahead around what happens next. So at this point in the drama, Joseph actually accuses his brothers of being spies. And while he sends them back to Canaan with grain, he says to them, "Mm, you need to leave Simeon here as a guarantee, and I want you to return to Egypt, but next time bring your younger brother Benjamin. So it's something of a blackmail, right? Like he keeps one brother there. And so the rest of the brothers go back to Canaan thinking, oh man, how are we going to convince dad to let Benjamin bring him back? Because we can't leave Simeon in, in Egypt forever, right? We've done that once. and it, was, it went wrong. So cat t- talk two, right? When the brothers return to Egypt, this time with Benjamin in tow, Skip in your Bibles to Genesis 45, verse 1. And I love this part because this is where the sort of seeds of reconciliation grow. So the brothers return for a second time, and they present themselves to Joseph. And then Joseph could not control himself. 
and he broke down and he wept and he essentially reveals his identity to them, right? That's important in the story. He reveals his identity to them and he says, I am Joseph. And essentially paraphrasing, he says, is dad still alive, right? Like it's, it's a, this big deal to see, is dad still alive? And then in 45 verse 3, note how the brothers respond. Different translations describe how the brothers were stunned, dismayed, speechless, and terrified as his presence. If we skip to Genesis 45 verse 4, look what Joseph says. He says, come near to me. I am your brother Joseph who sold you into Egypt. For you sold me into slavery but it was God who sent me to save your lives by a great deliverance. And then verse 14, weeping with joy, he embraces Benjamin and the others, and he spoke freely with them. Now, you'd be for forgiven to think that that's the end of the reconciliation story, but it's actually really not. And we're going to skip to the very end of Genesis, in Genesis 50, and see what happens then. So, fast forward in Scripture to the months following Jacob's death. Jacob, the dad, had passed away, and then we pick the story up in Genesis 50, verse 14. After burying Jacob, Joseph returned to Egypt, right? So he'd left Egypt, he'd got permission from Pharaoh to go and bury his dad, and then he comes back to Egypt. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful, and this is what they say. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong that we've done to him. In other words, reconciliation is not complete. Remember that this is a Middle Eastern honor culture. And Joseph's brothers were perhaps worried that even though Joseph had assured them that he was for them, that they worried that dad, the great human shield, the one who had favored Joseph, who was now no longer alive, he was now no longer able to save them from Joseph's wrath. And they essentially, and I'm going to paraphrase this as well, but they essentially send a message back to Joseph that says something along the lines of, just remember, dad said you had to be nice to us. Yeah? I don't know if you relate to that as a sibling, but mom said, you know, like kids do that all the time. And the brothers are doing that as well. Just remember, dad said you had to be nice to us. And so our story really climaxes in this, in this end of Genesis where we see that the reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers is not yet complete. And Joseph offers this magnificent gospel mirrored completion to reconciliation towards the end of um, chapter 50. So we're going to get deep down into those three verses. So if you're in your Bibles, go to Genesis 50 verse 19. This is what Joseph says. After his brothers send this message, are you really going to nail us? Remember, dad said to be nice to us. He says, don't be afraid of me. Am I God? Am I in the place of God that I can punish you? Verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. Verse 21, no, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. And so he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Those three verses is like a little pre-gospel nugget that's so important to us as believers who have been reconciled today. How did Joseph find the internal resources to do that? Remember that he was pre-church. We don't know whether he knew any other people who uh, loved the same God as he did. How did he do it? Well, in today's preach, I think... I would like to outline three reasons. One, Joseph is clear that he's not God. That's what helps him to reconcile. Two, Joseph saw his troubles from God's perspective. And three, Joseph relied on God's kindness to help him get through. So let's dive into point number one, that Joseph is clear that he's not God. Can you see in Genesis 50, 19, he says, am I in the place of God? He's very clear. He's, he's, he's very certain in his mind. He is not God. God is God. And you're probably thinking, yeah, Rob, that's obvious. Like none of us are God. But actually thinking that we are God and taking the position of God in our lives is actually the heart of many problems that we have as humans. How do we do this in our lives today? Well, Number one, we assume that we can be our own moral authority, right? We assume that we can be our own moral authority, that it's determined on the inside of you. If you flip back to the beginning of Genesis, humanity had one command, right? They had one job, don't eat the fruit of the tree. Why? Genesis 3 verse 5, eat the tree and you will be as God. 
In other words, you will assume your own moral authority. In other words, if you are deciding what is right and wrong for you, rather than following God's word and what he says, you're putting yourself in the place of God. And you're open, opening yourself up to a lot of problems. Number two, how do, we, how do we put ourselves in the place of God? We think that people can meet our deep, deepest needs. In other words, we look to people or we encourage them to look to us to do for them what only God can do. Spouses, therapists, teachers, doctors, politicians, they're all trying to help. It's all good, yet it's incomplete. They help somewhat, right? But ultimately, it's not marriage or medicine or psychology or education or policy that's your deepest need. Ultimately, your deepest needs can only be found in God. And point number three, and this is really uh, pertinent to the story of Joseph. How is Joseph clear that he's not God and how do we do this in our lives today? Well, we hold a grudge. You see, holding a grudge is a way that we take the place of God. Joseph was aware of the danger of holding a grudge or taking revenge. Because remember, holding a grudge is just taking revenge in your own heart. And to, to hold a grudge or take revenge is to put yourself in the place of God. The Bible is very clear. Romans 12 says, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge and I will pay them back, says the Lord. Remember that God shows us a kindness when he withholds things. Just like in, um, when Cam preached, like uh, God is not the God who will give you scorpions, unless of course you're an environmental science teacher, but he's not going to give you scorpions and snakes and stones. Like, no, he's going to withhold those things and he's going to give you good things. So when God says, I'm withholding something from you, that's a kindness. And here he's offering us a similar kindness and saying, hey, only I know everything. Only I am the sovereign one. And only I am able to appropriate justice. Only I can judge without becoming evil myself. In other words, only God can take revenge without hurting himself. You see, when we take justice into our own own hands and we seek revenge because it becomes this kind of feast of anger and bitterness and self-righteousness, and it's this gorgeous meal. I mean, it feels good, right, when you start? Like, it it feels great. It's this gorgeous meal that it feasts on, that you feast on, and and it tastes so good until you realize that you're actually eating yourself. It is impossible for humans to hold a grudge without harming themselves. And that's why when we take the place of God, we do that. And God says, that's not only dishonoring to me, but it's not good for you. Like, I've got a better way. All right, that's point number one, right? Am I in the place of God? Joseph is very certain that he's not God. Point number two. The second thing that helps Joseph offer such a beautiful reconciliation is that he adopts God's perspective on his troubles. We're going to double click on the middle verse, Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. You see, Joseph makes the decision to see his troubles through the perspective of God, where he knows that God has got the perspective from the top. He can zoom out, right? He's got the bird's eye view. I would liken this comparison to see where we are at the moment. You see, we see our lives through the street view on Google Maps, and that's Dockery, but God can see our troubles. He can see time from beginning to end, a bit like Google Map View sees us. Is that is that? That comparison, I don't know whether you've ever got lost. Like, I've got the sense of direction of a Kellogg's box of cornflakes, and so I get lost a lot. And so, you know, it, it, it really helps if you can adopt the perspective of someone who sees things from the beginning to the end. And we are helped when we can adopt God's perspective on our troubles as well. How humans view their troubles I think, tends to inhabit two different sides of the same spectrum. And Joseph does beautifully because he doesn't get caught in the spectrum. He adopts God's perspective. So if we look at the spectrum, right? On the one hand, we have humans, and I I fall into the spectrum as well. Some humans genuinely see things through the lens of good, right? God is good. Life is good. Hey, I might even be good. Life is beautiful and trouble is an anomaly. They live by the assumption that if you live for God and you're a good person, God will bless you. Right? That end of the spectrum. 
Others of us on the other end of the spectrum are far less optimistic. And they say that life is full of pain and troubles are inevitable. Bad things are the status quo. And so why expect to see wonder and goodness? You're just as good as the next amoeba, right? We're just a byproduct of billions of years of evolution and human depravity is a consequence of that as well. Friends, this spectrum is completely untrue. This position will rob you of the goodness of God in your life and this position will nullify your need for grace. Like both are redundant, right? This part robs you of the goodness and sovereignty of God in your life and this part nullifies your need for grace. We need to do away with the spectrum. If any part of these positions are true for you, you will have enormous difficulty making sense of the trouble in your life that will inevitably befall you as human. You see, if, if you at some level think that you are good and that you're trying to be a nice person and therefore deserving of good things, then, then if that is true, can you imagine the corollary to that, right? If, if that must be true, then it's negative must be true as well. That when trouble and suffering inevitably befall you, that you are simply not good enough. That if things are going good, then God is good. But if things are going bad, then either God is not good or he is not God. The assumptions of the spectrum hold when your idea of trouble and suffering include things like parking fines and hangovers and bad breakups, right? They hold for those kinds of things. But when your five-month-old is diagnosed with leukemia or you lose your spouse or you face unemployment, or you're suffering poor mental health, your theology completely falls flat. You see, Joseph had a very clear idea that he was not God, and that he had to adopt God's perspective on troubles. You see, he knew in his heart, he says, I am not good, and I am not God. God is God. He is good. And he acknowledges that life can be terrible that humans are evil, that trouble is inevitable, and here's the dialectical tension, and God is good, and he is sovereign, and he loves you, and he works all things for good. The question there for us is not why do bad things happen to good people. It should be. This should be your response. Like how gracious and good is God that good things should happen to me. And you can see that Joseph lives out of that position. Yeah? Okay. The third one. Joseph relies on God's great providence, and he knows, because he knows, because he knows in his heart that you can't be a grace giver unless you've been a grace receiver, right? So, and that's the, that's the vertical stuff around reconciliation for us. You become a grace giver when in your DNA you've understood, I'm a grace receiver. Double click on verse 21, 50 verse 21. No, Joseph says, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. And so he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Being a grace giver and one that is reconciled so freely is only possible in a man whose heart had been completely 100% transformed by grace. One, one who had received unmerited favor from a man who knew that he had received things that he 100% didn't deserve. Not because of anything Joseph was. Remember, he comes out of a family where he says, you're special. Like, you've got a special identity on you because you're my favorite. No, no. He says, it's nothing because of who I am or what I've done, but it's because of the one who'd offered the reconciliation. Joseph knew that God had looked at him and taken care of him despite coming from a deeply jealous lineage and had been conceited and brattish in his treatment of his brothers. He could only show that kind of kindness because he himself had encountered unmerited, unconditional, lavish, indulgent grace. And we are receivers of that as well. I don't know where this is landing with you, and you might be thinking of many examples of where you have been both a grace receiver and, and a grace giver. But, but let me share with you a modern day example of how being a grace receiver makes a person a grace giver. When we were living in South Africa, we employed a wonderful older woman to be our housekeeper. 
She must have been in her 60s. She was known to everyone in the community simply as Gogo, which in Zulu means granny. She was sharp, bubbly, warm. She was the, we all lived in a big school community and she was sort of the pied piper of all the kids. Like all the teacher's kids would just leave school and follow her around in the afternoons. They loved her. But Gogo had also lived through the brutality of apartheid, which for those of you who don't know, was an oppressively racially based regime, regime that um, systematically discriminated against people of color in just the most appalling kind of way. At its worst, it tore families apart, thousands of people died, many more tra uh, traumatized by systematized fear, racially based violence, and police torture. Gogol one day sat at my kitchen table with me and told me of how when she was in her early 20s, she had worked as a dishwasher in a restaurant owned by a white woman. A friend of hers, also a woman of color, had one night had a run-in or a conflict with the owner of this restaurant and was punished by having the bottom part of her ear cut off. And Gogol describes how both her and her friend had avoided the police and the hospital for fear that they would lose their jobs if they reported what had happened. Sitting at my own kitchen table, I just remember the shame that just embodied, embodied my body in that moment, right? That I had somehow benefited from the same entitled privilege that allowed one human being to treat another human in that way based on race. And so I, I quickly defended against my shame with anger and that this had happened, that there'd been no apparent justice or recourse. And so I said to Gogo, Gogo, why don't you go to the police? Like, apartheid is over. You know where this woman lives. Surely, Gogo, you want justice. Surely you're still so angry that you'd been mistreated so badly. And Gogo slowed down and truly like, looked at me at my own kitchen table as if I'd started speaking Greek. And she said to me, Robs, how can I accept the forgiveness of Jesus for everything he's done in my life and still hold that against that woman? How can I enjoy being forgiven and not forgive her? I still feel teary all these years later, knowing someone's deep embodied sense of grace, how the gospel had changed her on the inside. Astounding, astounding. I realized in that moment that the gospel had remained incomplete in me. I had valued the gospel for the eternal perks, right? For the third party insurance, having a little ticket against hell, just in case one day I did something really bad. But I hadn't actually pegged. I am a sinful, evil human in desperate need of reconciliation with a God to whom I had nothing to offer. And so commenced the real work of reconciliation in me. And it continues today. You see, when the gospel shakes you up and turns you upside down and inside out, as it should, you have got a resource within you to be a grace giver, right? Because you've been a grace receiver. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Like, I don't think you can ever, as a believer, outgrow that truth. That, that you can ever outgrow what the gospel does and continues to do in your DNA. It's wonderful. Before we move on, just as a little postscript that I think feels a little bit out of place, but I think it's important that we say it, it's, it's really important that we don't conflate the idea of forgiveness and the lack of boundaries in contexts that actually invite further abuse, right? So forgiveness is important, but forgiveness is not the tolerance of a situation that encourages mistreatment. So, so if you or if you know someone that are in contexts of abuse or mistreatment or neglect or domestic violence or child protection concerns, I think it's very appropriate for statutory law to run its course and forgiveness can be something that happens in you, if that makes sense. All right, we are heading towards the end. We're on the downhill, guys. Um, the story of reconciliation of Joseph and his brothers is so beautiful, like it does something to us, right? Because it is an echo, it's a tiny little mirror of a much greater story. And the greatest story plays out in the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus. And it even continues today after his ascension. And this is because Jesus is the greater Joseph, right? 
Jesus is the greater Joseph. Another way of thinking about this preach is like the gospel according to Joseph. I mean, Joseph was pre-Jesus, but he echoes something of the gospel in his story. Jesus only really physically takes form in the New Testament, but Jesus himself in Luke 24 says, and this is my paraphrasing, all of scripture is about me, right? Like it points to me. It points to the great reconciliation story that I'm part of across time. So to end this, I think it's important that we look at how Joseph is simply the dress rehearsal. He's the forerunner to the absolute reconciler, Jesus. So we're going to look at these uh, parts of scripture in Genesis, and then I'd like you to look at them through the lens of Jesus, that you can see God does this beautiful thing across the Bible, that he puts the story of reconciliation reconciliation in Joseph's life, but actually it echoes to where we find ourselves today. Joseph was given a cup of suffering by his brothers, but because he knew something of the shadow of grace of the coming king, he could say, and this is scripture, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. So Joseph gets this cup of suffering. Jesus drank the cup of suffering, the sin of humanity, but because he embodied grace, right, and because he is the coming king, he could say, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. Joseph, the, the mini Jesus, the little echo, provides bread for an entire region and many nations. Jesus declares himself the bread of life and says to all mankind, you can find eternal satisfaction in me. God used the evil of Joseph's brothers to have Joseph exalted to the second highest place in all of Egypt and surrounds. In Acts, we read, Jesus was delivered and nailed to the cross by the evil actions of wicked men, all within God's foreknowledge and purpose. You see, God's sovereignty remains consistent across stories, across time, across your life today. Joseph was seated at the right hand of Pharaoh, and wherever he traveled, people in many nations would bow the knee. The greater Joseph, Jesus, in Philippians 2, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, elevated to the highest place of honor, and given the name above all other names, that whenever, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Remember, Jesus, the greater Joseph. You see, the big story from Joseph is actually what we learn about Jesus and his great work for us. Have you received the forgiveness from the greater Joseph, Jesus? It's probably the most important question you'll ask in your, or answer in your entire life. Have you received forgiveness from the greater Joseph, Jesus? You see, I'm going to take you back to that first part of when we unpacked Scripture. When Joseph's brothers saw Joseph for who he was, remember Scripture says he was stunned, dismayed at their sin. And then what does Joseph do? He beckons them. He says, come to me, and he comes before them. In the bigger story, when we see Jesus for who he really is, when he reveals his identity to us, we should also be stunned and dismayed at our sin. And Jesus responds in exactly the same way. He beckons us and comes toward, to come toward him. Initially, in the Joseph story, the brothers didn't recognize Jesus. Joseph, gosh, that was a slip. The brothers didn't recognize Joseph, but he knew them immediately, right? Maybe you're sitting here today and you don't know about Jesus. You're not totally sure of him, right? Could he just be a moral teacher, an ancient prophet, or a nice guy? But you wouldn't say that you recognize him as king. Jesus knows you already. Just like Joseph recognized his brothers from across the room, Jesus recognizes you from across eternity. And a moment comes for all of us when someone explains to you or by revelation that you realize that Jesus is not just a religious figure, but he is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Note that in the Joseph story, Joseph makes the next move. Church, in our story, Jesus makes the next move for you too. In the Joseph story, at the end of it, Joseph fell on his brother's neck and wept. Can you imagine that this moment throughout his life would almost be unimaginable? I mean, he didn't even know if he could go back to Canaan. How, how crazy that God would bring this great reunion to him towards the end. 
Genesis 45, Joseph says, Come near to me. I am your brother, Joseph, who you sold into Egypt. For you sold me into slavery, but it was God who sent me to save your lives and the lives of many others by a great deliverance. In the Jesus story, Jesus too says, come near to me. It's okay. I'm so glad you came. I will be kind to you. I am the Messiah, the King, the Rescuer. I am Jesus, the one that you sinned against and sold into death with your sin. You sold me into death, but it was God who sent me to save your lives by a great deliverance. I have brought eternal life to the whole world. Sam and Beck are, are going to come up and we're going to end in, in a sort of moment of reflection and a song. But, um, oh, and Ryan, sorry. Um, but, but I really don't want this to just be an enlightening moment for all of you, right? Like I don't want it just to be this intellectual understanding of, oh, how Joseph and Jesus' lives mirror each other across the Old and the New Testament. I really want you to experience and know this Jesus who loved you. The Jesus who says to you, come to me, I will be kind to you and I will provide for you and your families. Remember that you can only be a grace giver once you've been a grace receiver. And so as we sing this next song, it is really appropriate that we start with the vertical relationship. Are you appropriately repentant, just like Joseph's brothers stand and dismayed at your sin and, and have this revelation of your great need for a savior, of a savior who went 100 plus nothing, like he did it all just for you. Perhaps you feel unforgiven. Perhaps you, like me, feel sometimes that the gospel remains incomplete and you long for a gl greater closeness with Jesus, just like Joseph's brothers longed for a greater closeness to him. I, I would implore you, to navigate this kind of vertical relationship and reconciliation. Remember, there's nothing you have to do. It is a free gift of grace, but you actually have to step into it. Yeah. And then I think there is a moment as well for us to think of our horizontal reconciliation, right? If you've been human for long enough, you can, you can know with some certainty of what it's like to be on the position of both the wronged and the wrongdoer. Perhaps you need forgiveness from horizontal relationships. Remember, the Bible says, don't just go through the motions of religion. Like, I'm not interested in the outside stuff. Like, really embody what I've taught you. Matthew 5, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to the person, and then come and offer your sacrifice to God. And perhaps you are holding a grudge and you need to forgive someone else. I love that parable of Matthew 18, of the servant who had been forgiven a debt of a million dollars, something that he could never dream of repaying. And then he went to hold a debt over a few thousand dollars from a, from a fellow servant against him. Church, Jesus asks us to really take this business of being a grace giver after you've been a grace receiver, he asks us to think about reconciliation in all your spheres of life, political or otherwise, and he asks us to take the business of forgiveness seriously. It really should be a marker of how we live and a reflection of how much we've been forgiven. So we're going to lead into a song. I'm going to let God do what he does in your hearts, um, and then we'll, then we'll close.